All right, for our Valentine's Day special. We are proud to present, as well as pleased, Dr. D. Lindsay Berkson. Let me tell you all about her. Not all about her, but, but enough it'll get you rolling, all right? Uh, she's an author, and her latest, I believe, is Sexy Brain. Yes, sizzling intimacy and balanced hormones prevent Alzheimer's, cancer, depression, and divorce. It's about men and women and the newest understanding of the gut hormone intimacy and environment link. Save hormones, smart women. Hormone deception. Natural answers for women's health. Healthy digestion the natural way. Retraining your tongue. My mother who wore her purse as a shoe. Wow. Why is love so hard? Juicy souls. Crossing the bridge. I like this one. Death is perfectly safe. (laughs) Wow, this is going to rock. How to keep all your ducks in a row. Heart speak. Hormones aren't gorillas. That's a, a book about safe hormonal strategies. Hormones made easy. Body, mind, spirit. Collaboration on body, mind, spirit. Perspective of cause and cure in healing. Another one here is the foot book. Nutrition and hands-on therapy for natural healing. Reviving Mr. Happy. Alternative medicine, the definitive guide. Herman the Vegetarian Cat. (laughs) Nutritional Gastroenterology, coming soon, uh, as well as uh, Herman the Vegetarian Cat's not out yet, at least not as of this writing. And number 21, number 21, Body, Mind, Hormones, Mission, ebook. Now, that's just the beginning. Dr. Berkson is a thought leader in functional medicine with an emphasis on hormones, nutrition, digestion, and intimacy. A best-selling author, she wrote one of the first breakthrough books on endocrine disruption. That's a hormone deception, McGraw Hill. The first gut, body, mind, nutrition book. That's healthy digestion, the natural way. Published by Wiley, and one of the first books to show hormones lean on nutrients and healthy gut function. And that's a smart home, uh, safe hormones, smart women by the Awakened Medicine Press. Now, three of her well-known books converge in your bedroom as she presents a new problem. Wait for it. Environmental castration. And its solution in her latest book, Sexy Brain. She's taught for 35 years, relicensing uh, seminars for decades to professional MDs, pharmacists, chiropractors, MDs, acupuncturists, nutritionists. She, She formulated the first female nutraceutical line for physicians in the U.S., Metagenics Femline. She and Dr. J.V. Wright hold a patent on bioidentical hormones, including the nutrients that keep them safe. She was a hormone scholar at a world-renowned estrogen think tank at Tulane University, the Center for Bioenvironmental Research, where she worked with top scientists in the world on hormones, health, and the environment. Now, she's hosted a radio show, uh, actually that shows plural, for many years, such as the Wiseman Family Practice Health Hour in Austin, Texas. She hosted the Berkson Nutrition Hour at KEST in San Fran and a monthly column in the San Francisco Chronicle in the 1980s. She presently hosts the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. This is a well-recognized podcast, and on it, a uh, discussion of emerging perspectives and controversies on health care, hormones, the environment, all aspects of life management in a frenzied world, take the four. The show is a mingling of solo dialogue, along with interviews with respected authorities like Drs. Alan Gaby, Dr., uh, wait a minute, David Brownstein, and MIT's senior scientist Stephanie Senna. And that's Dr. Stephanie Senna. A little bit more here now. Dr. Berkson has a master's in nutrition with three higher board certifications in nutrition. She co-invented one of the first botanical pharmaceutical combination drugs and has collaborated and published peer review original research on dialysis and nitric oxide with the University of Texas Medical School at Houston. She's a research fellow of the prestigious Research Institute Health Science Collegium. 
Dr. Berkson consults with people all over the world, works with integrative team medical practices, combining medicine with science-based nutrition and hormonal strategies. She's known for her connect-the-dots approach to science and introducing breakthrough health issues to the public, and then strategizing unique but safe natural answers. She has pioneered the concept of green pregnancies and the unappreciated role of hormones and the gut. Wow. They say it's all in the gut, so let's get down to it. Hey, Dr. Lindsay Berkson, welcome uh, to the program. It's so great to have you with us. Wow, what a, what a CV. Amazing. It's so nice to be with you. Let me tell you, this is going to be a high point on my CV. I've been a big fan of yours. I love your voice. I love how you bring incredible cutting-edge information to arm your audience with how they can live better, and I'm excited to be here. Thank you. Wow. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. I, um, I, I just have to ask. I mean, I think this is, a, you know, I ask this question all the time because, you know, I think it's important to begin at the beginning instead of in the middle. But uh, what led you into this research? Why did you become so interested in this, uh, in this uh, amazing, you know, when it's laid out like that, when, when your work is described, it suggests something obvious here, but apparently it's not obvious to most people. And I'm just wondering what led you into this specific area of, uh, of medicine and, and really, I mean, helping people, because, I mean, that's what this is all about. And clearly... You know, you were, you've been thinking about this for a long time. That is a great question. I think the first thing, and this happens to a lot of people, is how often I was ill myself. And I was very ill over many years and didn't know why. But I got the memo when I was very young that you should work out. My mother was an amazing athlete, and she was running marath- equivalents of marathons till she was 79. So I was very athletic, and I had heard a lecture when I was in my teens that you are what you eat. So I was doing a lot of the things, that are the tools of well-being throughout my life, but I kept getting the wrong answers, and I didn't know why. And I would learn things to help my patients, and I got helped a little bit here and there by nutrition and functional medicine docs, so I was putting my toe in. But I never really got completely well. And it wasn't until I came up with the idea of writing the book Hormone Deception because I read an article that the environment that we live in, pollutants in our air, food, and water could enter our body and hijack our own critical signaling systems. This was huge and unheard of about two and a half decades ago. And while I was reading um, that article, I thought, I've got to write a book on this. I've got to start really researching this. And I ended up for six years writing a book on one of the breakthrough books on endocrine disrupting compounds breakthrough meaning it was one of the very first books ever written on that based on that i ended up getting invited to have a gig at tulane in fact my mentor at tulane called me up and he acted like the godfather he said i'm gonna make you an offer you can't refuse (laughs) (laughs) and he let he invited me to go work um at tulane with the top scientists but while i was researching that book I realized that many of the animals that are exposed to the model compound of how we test whether something we're exposed to in our daily life, in our hair care products, um, in outgassing from vinyl floors, and the plastics that your kids put in their teeth, that the animals exposed to that when they're pregnant, their offspring ended up having almost exactly what I had. I couldn't believe it. Everything that I battled all my life, I was now having and recognizing that endocrine disruptive Um, experimentation was showing this in offsprings in the laboratory so I wrote away from my mother's microfish film and her birth records and I discovered while I was writing the book on endocrine disruption that my mother was given it was given to millions of women for um, 36 years DES as a prenatal vitamin and a few other um, uses that were considered to make a normal pregnancy healthier when in fact it turned out to be a class one carcinogen and the number one most powerful endo, um, endocrine disrupting compound that's ever been invented. Well, right then and there I realized that I was a victim of the very book that I was writing about, of the phenomena that I was introducing to the public, and this was really a mission. That was one reason why I've gotten into this, my own ill health and then it overlapping with our expanding understanding of the critical role that hormones play in our body and the toxic soup that we live in that's futzing and hijacking those signals up. The second one was I've always been attracted to media and to 
to medicine. So I got a degree at the University of Michigan in radio, TV, and media, and I also got a degree in bio um, psychology and neurology. But as I went forward and went more into medicine, I ended up doing the other fateful thing in my life. I did my first rotation in integrative medicine with Dr. Jonathan Wright. It was in 1977, several years before he is now um, called the father of bioidentical hormones because a few years later one of his patients said to him, hey doc, why don't you give me a hormone that's like my own hormone rather than one of the synthetic ones? And he thought that sounded like a great idea being the open-minded visionary that he is, so he did. And the other student that was there at the time was Dr. Alan Gaby, who had just finished his master's um, in statistics at Yale and had already been a medical doctor. And Jonathan fixed us up on a date, but instead we became best friends. And the three of us have been like the three musketeers over many decades of our lives, all of us totally geeks to the max, spending much of our free time in the medical literature with an emphasis on nutrition, hormones, and the gut. And I've been very fortunate to have all these great mentors, and it turned out that even my own illness could be turned around by learning medicine from the inside out. So that would be my answer to that. And, and what was the illness specifically? I had just an ongoing theme. I ended up having multiple cancers, multiple tumors. That was the big thing were tumors. And I had lots of estrogen driven illnesses. I had um, lost seven and a half organs, 18 lymph nodes. And about 20 years ago, many after I'd lost many different organs and couldn't get out of bed for about a year, year and a half, even though I was eating well and exercising prior to that when I could, well-intentioned endocrinologists, experts, etc., would put their hand on my shoulder and say, look it, you've lost all these organs. Now we know you're a DES daughter. You were exposed to this nasty drug in the womb, your most vulnerable period of exposure. You really are just going to have to learn to suck it up and age gracefully. Well, I never take old or ill for an answer. I always believe if you can, and this is how I work with my patients and how I consult, if you could figure out what's really wrong, then you could fix it. So the expert said, look it, you've had this horrible, nasty exposure in the womb, and now you've lost all these organs. You're never going to be a vibrant person. But what I discovered by sleuthing the literature was how did this drug tamp down our protective tumor suppressor genes? I found out exactly which tumor suppressor genes, the ones that are supposed to watch our physiologic back daily because we always get cancer cells here and there, and we've got tumor genes that are set to pounce on them and tamp them down so we can move forward across time safer. And then I discovered um, how they, uh, which genes they tamp down, and then I sleuthed the literature to figure out what compound might boost up those genes so I could overcome my genetic fate. And then again, I asked Dr. Wright, who's been such a pivotal player in my life. I said, I've come up with this underlying hypothesis of the underlying mechanism of why DES did its dastardly footprint on me. Would you please write this pre uh, prescription, which was the first non-commercial prescription for this compound, and let's give it a try. And before then, I'd been having tumor after tumor after tumor, cancers. In fact, my mentor at Tulane when I went up one time to give a talk at EDOC hormone conferences, he introduced me by saying, here's somebody who keeps losing more and more of herself but keeps looking better and better. And based on that prescription, I stopped the tumor madness. Because once <clears throat> I figured out how DES was damaging my body, even though the exposure was in the womb, we could then hypothesize which compound would help fix it and Thank goodness it did, and thank goodness I had the resources like Dr. Wright to write that prescription. And that has happened in my lifetime a number of times because DES offspring, many of them my age, are no longer here. And you read this litany of all my books, yeah. which are my children, because DES daughters, most of them, can't have kids. So because of this exposure in the womb, I couldn't have children. But I always believe in making lemonade out of lemon. I mean, so this is the off. It ended up being that my own life experience has allowed me to help many other people, and I'm still going strong. And so you never know where your fate will take you. You know what? That's the. That's interesting. 
I, I just use a, a slightly different arrangement of words. I say you never know where your fate lies, and you don't. You don't. You don't. In fact, I could tell you, and I don't know, maybe we'll get into it in this hour or not, but it, because of the, the far-reaching negative effects of endocrine-disrupting compounds in the womb, I've had even other issues, and they usually tend to be horrible issues that the regular top experts in allopathic or conventional medicine can't help. And then I've got to put my thinking cap on to figure out what is my hypothesis of how it's doing this and how might I reboot it, and then I end up um, going about a new way. And because of these issues, I've ended up from that acumen and agile thinking to be able to help a lot of complex cases. So my semi-retirement practice now is an educational consulting business that I have all over the world with physicians, with oncologists, with patients, patients who have not been helped or have been told they have no answer. And I might sit with them on the first intake for three hours, and then on my write-up, I might take an hour, an hour and a half, and ponder and pull together and connect the dots of research. And of course, I've been in practice 46 years, so you get to see a longer terrain when you've been around longer as long as you yourself are dynamic still. So I've ended up to take that template of how I've helped myself and I can now with such a heart of hope, so many people walk in with no hope. And what I love is to hear when they leave my office that for the first time in a long time they feel hopeful. But of course the proof is in the pudding and I have a pretty high rate of getting people well that nobody could but no one can help everybody 100% across the board. But a lot of that has come from my own having to hack my own health out of the mountainside and pulling it off because I'm healthier now in my 60s than I ever have been in my entire life, let alone my 20s. I can't believe what I'm hearing. You're in your 60s? Yes, yes. That's why the beat is so long. No, no, you're lying. You're making this up. Come on. Blessings. Oh, I got to meet you in person. What can I say? You've got a great voice. And, you know, the 60s is the new 40s. If you got all the memos and you know how to do many things right, and when things show up, because things always show up in everybody's life, illness and trauma and injury show up. But if you have an agile team to help you, often you can overcome even what seems like by straight medicine doesn't have an answer for you. So I've been blessed to have that path in my life. Look, I mean, you're. I, I realize we're coming over a Skype trans transmission here, but when you when I heard you say forty six years, I went, "That's got to be a verbal typo." <laughs> you know, seriously, because I mean, you appear to me to be. I mean, I mean, it, I'm stunned. I mean, I really am. Your 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 skin and your eyes are your eyes are so bright. Your skin is. Is uh, beautiful. I mean, we're, and we're over a Skype transmission here. Uh, maybe you're just one of these women that actually looks good under fluorescent light. I don't know, you know, but because um, everybody looks pretty rough under fluorescent, that's that's astounding. I, 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 I had not- the best experience. I was lecturing with Eldred Taylor, who's a gynecologist in Chicago, and we were talking about estrogen metabolism and how to help internists and family practice docs and gynecologists take a look at hormones in a different way than the straight way like how to help you think outside the box with a lot of science-based information, but to look at the patient that you couldn't help in a better way so you might be able to. So he said, can I tell them your age? Can I tell them your age? And I'd never had my age screamed out over the podium. And I said, yes. And at the break, I was surrounded by all these young, it reminded me of little birds with their mouths open. Of all the- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, young birds on a branch. They're in the nest. Feed us, mummy. Wow. Unbelievable. Saying, Tell us what to do. We'll do it because we want to look like you when we're that old. Oh. <laughs> yeah, sitting there like young owls on a branch. Yeah. Wow. Who? Well, look, um, <clears throat> let's get caught up a little bit here quickly. You were losing organs. What does that mean? Well, a kidney removed, an adrenal gland removed, half of my thyroid removed, a parathyroid removed, um, you know, on and on and on, losing organs because straight medicine if you have a tumor most of the time of course this is now 20 years ago and some of those dynamics might have changed with the new information but back then if you had a suspicious malignancy or you had um, a variety of you know this is very common today even like with endometriosis what they'll do is keep just taking out 
the implants, the endometrial implants, but if we work with a woman strategically, hormonally, nutritionally, we often get her well, get her able to be pregnant without needing to have those surgeries. But I have learned, you know, I think if doctors today got in med school a disease that they had to pretend they had, that was really difficult and the treatment was going to be devastating. I think that when they would sit on the other side of the desk, your interplay and dynamic would be so different because yeah. it made me so different. I, I think of myself as smart plus heart because I've been through so much. But now if I knew, knew then what I know now, I wouldn't have had to go through it. But going through it allowed me to be the thinker I am for the people I work with. You know, this cancer thing is real serious, and there's a lot of conflicting information out there by way of, uh, hey, here's our latest presentation. I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Uh, every once in a while, I, I'll scan the uh, the public television channel because I like the – they got some outstanding uh, British, uh, especially Kudos Productions. They put out some great spy stuff and crime stuff and the occasional British comedy that goes back to the Stone Age. But but uh, even those are kind of funny, too. And um, – and there was this campaign that was just it just rolled on for I don't even know how many months now certainly three, and it was this two in three men and one in three women will get cancer, not are at risk for it, will get it. And then just the other day I say, well, you know, I, somebody I think it was Fox News um, or a commercial that ran during it or something, but anyway, a mainstream outlet said, well, you know, cancer rates are down twenty percent across the country. So it's like, oh, wait a minute. Which is it? Cancer rates are down 20% or we're all going to die from it? Two out of three men, one out of three women. I mean, are there any, is there such a thing as an accurate statistic? I remember that whole thing that Mark Twain said about them. But, um, but, but where do you even find any, any reliable data? I mean, I'm beginning to wonder in a sea of data if there is any reliable data. Boy, that is such a great comment, John, because some of the editors of the prestigious journals like New England Journal of Medicine are now coming out saying that you really can't trust what are statistics because so much of um, graft and inappropriate representation. In fact, I, I read, like Jonathan and Alan, the body of a lot of articles, and sometimes you can't even trust the abstract that gets published in PubMed, which is a service of the National Institute of Health where everyone has access to the abstracts. But if you read the belly of the article, the abstract where they're trying to really tout a drug or the mechanism that will support later on a drug might not even be in, re in reality reflecting what's in the inside. So I think what's really important is then the same statistics are for diabetes, for example, is to supersede statistics because those kind of statistics make us as patients own a learned helplessness. Wow, what a statement. We're all going to get this. There's nothing I can do. You've got type 2 diabetes and it's a chronic progressive disease and you're going to end up with eye disease, kidney disease, lose some of your feet. There's nothing you can do. When the truth of it is, if you work with some agile thinkers often, that is not the truth. And there are physicians like Dr. Jason Foon, a nephrologist up in Toronto, Canada, who is reversing type 2 diabetes in several weeks, even in people who've had it for 40 years and mostly with no medication. So there are pockets of medicine that are pushing, pushing the boundaries of the way that a person stays ill in today's society. We've got great ERs, great ICUs. If you break your hip, wow, we've got the best hip replacement. But in chronic degenerative disease, including cancer, those statistics you talked about, and diabetes, et cetera, we make people feel that there's nothing they can do when that's not the truth, but it starts with the fork in the road of what you put in your mouth, your lifestyles, your choices, and working with a team that can figure out why are you wrong and what are your weakest links. And you can't do that in a five-minute office visit in an office with a huge volume. It's not set up to do that. Now, this, uh, this in utero disease, did you call it DES? Right, that's an acronym for the name of the drug that was given for many years, for, th for 36 years to millions of pregnant women, it's still given in some other countries presently, called diethylstilbestrol. And that is, you've heard now about plastics being estrogenic and sperm counts being down and senators jumping, jumping up in the Senate saying, I'm half the man that my father was because of the fertility, infertility increase. And it's all because of all these estrogenic compounds. 
DES was the most powerful estrogen ever made. Um, in fact, the, the physician that made it actually invented plastics. That's why plastics are so estrogenic. And it is the model compound to try and understand the chemical soup that we are in. In fact, Harvard, the School of Public Health on January 31st from Harvard just put on a public forum on hormone altering compounds and saying that the majority of many of our epidemics, whether they be cancer or diabetes, supporting the statistics that you just, just discussed, a lot of that is an offshoot from our 24-7 exposure to hormone disrupting chemicals. And it's, it's a big problem. It was controversial. It's no longer controversial. But now the issue is what to do about it. Where are we with um, vaccines? For some reason, the HPV vaccine popped into my head, and I wanted to ask you about that before it got away. Well, you know, um, I have been working for the last six years in alignment with the Wiseman Family Practice, which is a set of family doctors and a large number of nurse practitioners and other associated professionals, and they do not recommend giving that vaccine because there's so many articles and and so many um, uh, people have written in to the FDA that there have been really adverse events that happened in the life of that person after they had that vaccine. So, so much so that, that that is not a vaccine that we recommend. But I'm not a specialist in vaccines. I haven't read all of the data, but I know that um, a lot of vaccines have controversy around them. Some vaccines make sense to me. The number that we're recommending do not make sense to me. And once again, everything in medicine is risk versus benefit. So what really is the risk versus the benefit? Do we need all those vaccines? Some we do and some we don't. But that vaccine has seemed to have a bit a more uh, well-documented shadow over it. And would you want to give something to a young woman? You know, the brain is still developing till 21. All of the chemicals that we're exposed to all have potential adverse downstream effects. So as a parent, and as a person that owns a bodysuit, you want to try and minimize the negative and maximize the benefit. And sometimes there's a plus or a minus on your decision to do that vaccine. You shouldn't just take all vaccines carte blanche because someone in a white medical jacket told you to do so. You know, I don't want this to, um, I, I occasionally, just to kind of, you know, ensure that I can keep doing it if I feel like it, uh, engage in a little hand wringing sometimes. But really, it's the hand wringing today is 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 because of this question: What has happened here? It's 2017, and we're not evolving; we're devolving. You know, I mean, people like yourself are, are out there on the cutting edge, getting this done and getting people healed. Now, I keep hearing about, oh, this one over here died from cancer, or this one over here had it just running rampant, and they're totally clear, and everything's 100%, it's fine. I'm going, wait a minute. Why did it take out person A, but person B is okay? How is it that chemo cleared this one, and chemo almost killed this one, and they abandoned chemo, went the holistic approach, and now they're okay? I mean, what has happened to us? I, I don't know. I would like to think that we're all together in some sort of a... In some sort of a culture, you know, we have, uh, you know, our civilization stands unique. We we have good uh, communication. We have good intercommunication between these different groups. We can all somehow get on the same page. We can move healing forward. And then here comes the hand-wringing part. There seems to be an agenda to chop people's lifespan uh, a little bit shorter than it otherwise would have been. And they just go... Well, come on in here, take this, take that, take the other. And there seems to be less and less regard for what's actually being prescribed. I, I'm sensing that I'm all over the place with this, but I guess the short question is, what the heck has happened to what promised at one point when we were kids to be this genius, brilliant future of, uh, of, uh, of, of medical research that would result in some really good um, um, benefits to the, to the civilization? And then you look... On the other hand, you go, well, we have this extraordinarily uh, money-driven system now that's going to fix your problems. And then you go to the grocery store and half the stuff in there will kill you if you keep eating it. Well, yeah. you know, it's so interesting. I have patients all over the world, and, I, and they're very conscious. They're mindful. So I have this group of people in Switzerland and Yugoslavia, and they eat very well there. And every day they walk to the 
food market to get their food fresh every day. They don't keep it in their refrigerator or in boxes and their shelves. And they came over to the United States, a number of these patients, not related to each other, and they were here eating well for three or four months, purchasing their food at Whole Foods, which you would think would be the best that we have to offer, that has more organic food than not. And they gained 30 to 40 pounds, and their health really altered adversely. And they shared this information with me, and it was very mind stunning for me to hear that. And it's very hard to get away from our level of plastics, our level of chemicals, how much our medicines are driven by money, even though we have a lot of great things in healthcare. We have a lot of great things in healthcare, so I don't mean to put every aspect of healthcare down, but a, a, great, a great example of it is doctors are taught to only read the laboratories, not listen to the patient. I was taught by Dr. Gaby and all my mentors Listen to the patient, not just the laboratory. That is really a very big difference. And they also really feel frightened to go outside the box of what their associations tell them to do. They, they get sent emails and faxes to be told how to proceed with different protocols. So I had another one of my DES issues that came up is I had an issue with my eyesight and I was being treated by a number of eye experts and they did some surgeries, they did some medications, and finally there was a very rapid, severe progression of vision loss. And my eye experts threw up their hands and said, this is very atypical, we have nothing to offer you at all, we don't know what to do. So I ran, because I don't take old or ill for an answer, and started to sleuth out a lot of the information that was available and discovered and made a new theory of what was going on, measured the level of that compound that I thought was creating an inflammatory storm in my optic nerve. Sure enough, I was fivefold elevated. I once again invented an eye ophthalmic solution that Jonathan wrote the script for and created a protocol and I started to reverse and have been completely improving my eyesight better than it's been in years. I went back to these professionals and said, look, this is what I'm thinking, these are the 70 articles in the literature, this is the basis of this, and the nice guy who was nice inside the box, the greatest guy, a wonderful doc, is congenial and is thoughtful when I was doing his surgeries and procedures, looked at me and said, you're diagnosing and treating yourself. You have no right to do that. You're not an eye doctor. I can't hear this. I don't want to hear this. Yeah, I saw that coming. I'm sorry I did. <laughs> <laughs> My visual field index test was improving or why it's out of the box and the, in the, the money has driven docs to go the pharmaceutical route and the way everyone is taught at least up till now because maybe there's some bastions of change on the horizon yay hope but so many people are so fearful to think outside the box and thus the patient loses out and identifies with learned helplessness darn and they go blind the other patients that don't know this maybe this won't help everybody but Jonathan and I are waiting a little longer to gather all the data and then we're gonna write this up because there's lots of other ways to skin a cat or try and save your eyesight but if the allopathic way that's right now if it works for you that's great but if it doesn't it's your sense you know as you age your senses age if there's other answers why should you not be open to that? Why can't you help anyway? So, you know, it's the way that medicine has unfolded because of following the money, I think, and the template in how doctors are trained. An article came out just this week that doctors trained in other countries, and we have about 35% of our doctors from other countries, have less mortality within the first month of working with patients than doctors trained in the U.S. Yeah, there's something wrong here. There, there really is. There, I mean, there's something. Uh, it's not like that microphone cable we were arguing about earlier. It's like, how <laughs> how is it she's still able to hear us? Everything's unplugged, and I got my foot on the switch. You know, it's sort of the same thing. At first, it eludes us, and then we find out that there is a specific problem. And, um, I mean, really, that's why that's why we're talking together on the program here, to, to put the word out that just because you get – you get some news that you don't want to hear. It doesn't mean that you're done. But, you know, when people get, when they're informed that they got a problem, it really it, it really is, tends to vapor lock you. 
and you, and you don't all of a sudden you know the the ideas and the options that you kind of were floating around in your mind two weeks ago now you've actually received some bad news and you don't remember any of those options you don't even remember what what book you wrote the note in so to speak so I wonder if I mean is there any kind of a um, some wonderful clearing house uh, so to speak or some wonderful repository of of uh, of data where people who go to mainstream medicine and they get a mainstream answer, which is, well, it's going to be this and you can expect that, where they can just go, well, I'm not going into that room. I'm going to go into this room over here and and find out. You know, they're saying, well, you're going to lose your vision. you got diabetes, so we're just going to have to manage it. It's like, well, I don't want to manage it. I don't want that room. I want to go to this room over here where when I go in there and start looking at the data, we can figure out how to make the diabetes go away. I mean, it's yeah. almost as though when people get an ailment, they're just stuck with it. It can't be cured. It can only be managed and treated. I mean, what is that mentality? Well, Burton Goldberg was diagnosed with a number of different illnesses, and that's why he came up with the first edition of Alternative Medicine, the Definitive Guide, of which I was one of the three senior editors on the first edition. And his he had that same experience. And many people who go through crisis, when you're suddenly given a, a diagnosis that's a crisis, your whole life is bombed. And... It's very scary not to go the main path because usually allopathic doctors put down other paths because it's human nature and um, it's often more common in medicine to be down on what you're not up on. People will say, well, there isn't any research to prove that nutrition or alternative or natural answers work when that's not true. Alan Gaby spent his whole life, he's got his second edition of nutritional medicine, 1,550 pages of natural answers that are based in science or clinical observations by people who really have medical degrees. So it, that's why I feel it, before you get a diagnosis that's going to really take the floor out from underneath you, which most of us in our life will once or twice or more, get a team surrounding you of agile thinkers that have a great integrative doc, a great straight doc, a great um, nutritional medical nutritionist and agile thinkers that are open to each other and not closed off thinking they know everything and because really you're limited by what your doctor doesn't know and your doctor doesn't know what they don't know. So you want a team of people who understand their things they don't know and they're open-minded to kind of stay on the pulse of what's going on so they learn more and more so they can assist you when you end up in a crisis and you're not having to just take what straight medicine offers you, which sometimes it's a merge of the two. It's the best of both worlds. But it's hard to know what to do when your brain is just being banged. You now have oatmeal mush in there because of your cortisol secretion from stress of hearing a, a crisis diagnosis. So plan ahead would be one of my major thoughts because there isn't a clearinghouse at this point. That's what a lot of these books are about. There's websites like Green Medicine Info. That's what A4M is. Um, I teach, I'm teaching a course at A4M which trains functional medicine MDs from 120 countries in September and they train doctors and they try and expose them to lots of different thinking. But really it's so much the karma of who you get to meet and what they've gone through to gather all this data so their doctor bag is huger and bigger and better and not so egoful but more mindful to try and help you so it's usually comes down to who you know stop for a minute folks so we started talking about about wine and um you know and you said you like scotch you know i like the taste of it but i got to tell you that stuff does not like me i like me glen <laughs> fittick every once in a while i drive to glen Morangi. But I got to tell you, for some reason, I don't know what it is about scotch, but that stuff gives me a headache. I don't know why, but it's like if, if I, you know, I don't drink it and, and get a buzz on it or anything. But if I just, you know, have have a decent scotch, I will have a headache all night and wake up frequently going, God, I'm having the hangover now. And I didn't even, even drink that much. But I do like my Jameson. I do like Irish whiskey because it's, uh, it's sweet and it's good. You know People don't realize that a lot of the wine that they get that's not really high quality wine in America is actually made with plastic wraps inside the oak vats and there's uh. a lot of phthalates and endocrine disruptors in the wine that they think they're drinking to get the healthy resveratrol. So it, we're going to talk soon about this toxic soup that we live in and unfortunately that can also include the beverages that you imbibe. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, no, so you like red, what kind of red do you like? 
I, I really do like um, uh, Cabernet, and my favorite is Silver Oak, the really high-end Silver Oak. And I know my friends that sell wine say, oh, that's just what, you know, they sell the tourists, the people who like really oaky flavor. But I guess I like really oaky flavor without a lot of tannins. But I love cabs, real rich red, uh, deep, uh, without any sugary, fruity kind of flavor to it. That's what I enjoy. You know what you might really like? And I've become what? quite a fan of it myself. It's uh, it's great with uh, with meat or just to just have a glass of it. And it's a uh, a bourguie, b o u r g u e i l bourguie, and um, and you'll like it. I love to cook, so I'll have to cook you my five star organic dinner, and you can bring the bourguie. <laughs> you bet. I'll pull a warwicker on you, and I'll bring two cases. Um, you know, I wanted to tell you, I was thinking about what you were saying about medicine. You know, you, I could get your frustration and I'm right in there with you and I had two thoughts while we were gone. Do you mind if I say them? I, listen, you are at liberty to say pretty much whatever you want. Uh-oh. Yeah, Uh-oh. let them have it. <laughs> well, part of the thing is because we have the we have the plus in the mind, everything in this material world that spiritual, spiritual leaders say is the dualistic world. We've got the dark and the light has its good and its bad sides. We've got computers and we've got more things that work on the binary system. Yes, no, be in a box, don't be in a box. And medicine has gone that way with treating disease with algorithms. And you take the patient and if you do this and this, and if it's not that, you go this and this, and if it's not that, it's this and this. But with chronic disease, usually people get ill because of a perfect storm. And the answer to that perfect storm isn't usually a this or a that or a binary answer. And then enter in in 2017, which has been happening really since World War II, the environment is now sitting between you and your doctor. There's a lot of environmental input into chronic illness, and we're going to hear soon even intimacy and love and the ability to benefit from intimacy and love that nature wanted as your birthright from our toxic environment. But if that's not even addressed in the algorithm or in the intake, then you might be re really ill because of toxic exposures or because of endocrine disruptive compounds or other things that are very real, but they're not even part of the assessment and part of the treatment. So I think that's another uh, weak link of today's world, but it's beginning to change with some people, uh, colleagues of mine that are brave environmental scientists that are really in the think tank that I worked at Tulane, starting to really shake the shoulders of medicine of what's happening. So we're going to see a change, but I think that's also one of the angsts, one of the frustrations of it is the elephant in the living room that might be part of your illness isn't really getting addressed. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, I suppose the key is to disrupt the perfect storm system in some way. Exactly. You have to figure out the perfect storm and then fix it. Find what, what makes it continue to go to make you continually ill and stop it. And that means having a great understanding of physiology and of how it's disrupted and how to get it back to optimal rather than just a medication to tamp down the symptoms that aren't really addressing what was keeping you in that perfect storm. You know, um, we really wanted to talk to you for for the uh, the Valentine's Day program. And it was like, sexy brain. I like this already, you know, because uh, as uh, some quite, quite older gal said many years ago when I was a child, I just heard this, you know, because she was a little bit on the... Uh, she was, she was a little bit on the edge. She, she didn't keep quiet. And I'll tell you who it is. It was a, this gal named Mary Highsmith, and her daughter was Patricia Highsmith, who wrote Strangers on a Train, which was then uh, uh, made into a motion picture by Alfred Hitchcock, of all people. In fact, I have the premier tirage of, uh, of that particular book. And you drink that wine, Burgo, while you're watching the premier tirage. <laughs> That's it. That's it. <laughs> I love and, to connect the dots, well, yeah. What she said was, look, it's all in your mind. It's all in your mind. Then you go to Neville Goddard, you know, one of the one of the uh one of the um proponents of the uh, major proponents of the the free thought movement of the 30s. You know, there is no reality outside consciousness. So, okay, take a little Goddard and take a little Mary Highsmith and you wind up with, yep, I'm pretty sure it's all in your mind. And which leads us to um, the uh, the Valentine's Day focus of love. 
Now, living in Dallas, I tell people there's a big difference between Texas and Dallas. You know, the whole the whole map turned red except for Dallas and Austin, but Dallas was a much uh, b- a larger blue spot. And the divorce rate in Dallas was, um, I mean, the last time that I checked was about 50% of the marriages that occur in this town will be gone in less time than the length of your average car loan. 50% divorce rate within about five years was this statistic. This is back in the day. I haven't checked in a while, but it was not good. And um, I heard you mention a while ago before we got rolling here that love is under assault. What what has happened to love? Is there just uh, too much out there, too many options, too, too, it's too, too many uh, situations that are easy to catch, or, or what is it? Because... I don't think very many people would argue that the more the more you uh, you may not think you're giving your heart away with these uh, with one relationship after another, but you are. And, and in fact, I've thought that if you have too many romantic uh, encounters, you'll you'll render yourself incapable of ever having a one-on-one permanent relationship, a real a real marriage. So I'll just toss that out there and let you take it wherever you want to. Okay, well, I'm going to first talk about, now I want to address what you just said, but I'm going to back copy it first with okay. why I even, I'm a healer, a doctor. I never thought in a million years I'd be writing a book on intimacy. But I was approached a few years ago by a surgeon and a urologist that were planning on opening 100 erectile dysfunction clinics. And they said, we see you've written over 11 or 12 books on hormones, and we want you to write the book in the center of our reception area. And whatever urologist is heading that new clinic that we open, they'll co-author it with you. So I agreed, and I started for the first time to do due diligence and intimacy in sexual scientific literature, which I'd really, I talked to my patients a lot about intimacy, but I really hadn't written and done the due diligence like you have to do when you write a book. And I was stunned to start seeing what was out there. For example, the Women's Health Initiative was a series of studies run and headed by 40 different prestigious universities in Boston University Medical School to say we've got this fastest growing demographic of aging women. How do we take care of them? And how do we not topple Medicare? So let's look at them every which way. What's good for the their bones, what's good for their heart, and they noted that men, one of the first symptoms of cardiovascular disease and diabetes in men is often erectile dysfunction because their circulation is really hampered. And they wanted to know if it was the same way in women. So they did this really unique study that never got any press because sexual research doesn't get press because no one knows what to do with it. And it was run on almost 94,000 women at 40 centers over 12 years. It was called Sexual Satisfaction and Cardiovascular Disease. It was an observational trial. And it was enormously statistically significant that if a woman could look back over her lifetime and say, I've had satisfying, great intimacy with someone I really care for that she had healthier blood vessels than if she ate veggies, did exercise, took statins. It was really extraordinary. And then I started looking to more and more of the literature. And there was study after study, which is the hallmark of medicine, replication. If women could say that they had more satisfaction with sex, they used less antidepressants. They had less suicide attempts. They had less breast cancer. Women who had... Study, there are several studies to show that, and the same with men. Men had less prostate cancer. So I said, oh, my God. And at the same time that was happening, I began to notice in my practice, because I've been in practice so long, that more and more young people were coming in saying they really didn't care about having intimacy anymore with their mate, who they liked, but they endured it. They endured it. They would use that term, and I would be stunned and sit back. They endured Intimacy because they liked their mate, but they didn't enjoy it. And more men came in saying they were, and these are men in their 20s, 23, 24, erectile dysfunction symptoms. And suddenly we're seeing, just like we're seeing other chronic degenerative diseases that used to be in seniors, even in 7 and 8 and 10-year-old kids, it's shocking, we're seeing sexual dysfunction in 20-year-olds that historically were only seen in seniors. I was at a conference in Dallas, and there was this urologist from the NIH, and he said, oh, definitively, there's an epidemic of 20-year-old males that have no testosterone. 
could be diabetes, could be excess obesity, could be everything's a perfect storm, could be endocrine disrupting compounds. But we have many 20 year olds that have testosterone levels of 70 year olds. And I began to think that this was a new public health problem. And I never dreamed I'd write a book on love and sex, but I said, uh oh, I've got to do this as a healer. It's my next book. And as I started, I spent three years writing this book. I really go in depth in my books. They're not, I went to a, a marketing conference in San Diego a few months ago and they said, never write a book over 60 pages. People don't want to read anything anymore. Just do it as your calling card. That's not the books I write. I write books to take a look at the science and help you avoid the new public health issues coming down the pike. So I couldn't believe what I discovered that the science said that nature never does anything without a reason. Never. And we have pleasure and connection because it's part of nature's template, your birthright to keep your brain working better and your relationship more as a healthy glue together, which ultimately translates into a more stable family life. It's all about the next generation and smarter parents. And when I started to unravel this, it really blew my mind. And Sweden came out with this amazing study. We think of the Swedes as these gorgeous, lanky, blonde people that are very, um, you know, free with their sexuality. But actually, the Swedish government was noticing that white, right while what you were discussing in Dallas, and of course it's global now, is that within um, a few years, families that were together, they might not have been married and they had a child, they would separate before one of the children was five years old. Exactly what you said. And that's not good for a country because the stability and strength of a country starts with the strength of a home. So Gothenburg University followed a very large number of couples and tracked over eight years who stayed together because it was this five-year period of where people tend to split, who stayed together and who didn't, and why, exactly why. And they published it in, um, in Nordic Psychology 2016, just last year, and they basically said that couples that don't stay together don't know how to be sensual outside the bedroom as well as in the bedroom, that sex and intimacy is a huge chemistry factor that you can't deny, but people think if they meet the right person, it'll happen magically, and it takes education, and that it takes communication. And it's almost like a joke of a rabbi and a priest and a lawyer walk into a bar. But one of the studies out of the Journal of Sexual Medicine actually took four experts, a gynecologist, a psychologist, an endocrinologist, and a urologist, and they asked them, what's the future of medicine? And in this one article, they said, it's got to be about sex because science is showing that great intimacy is a pillar of health that's critical for all of our global health, especially our brain, as veggies and exercise, but my understanding with all the other books I've written on endocrine disruption is that ironically at the same time our toxic environments from the chemicals we're exposed to, the sexting, to the porn, to the obesity, to put the whole thing together because you can't isolate it, are now having young kids, the millennials don't even like to be identified by a gender. And when I worked at the Center for Bioenvironmental Research, Tyrone Hayes, who is a professor at Berkeley, was able to take atrazine that was sprayed on apples and spray it on pregnant frogs and the frogs born to those pregnant frogs sprayed with the pesticide would turn out a hundred percent of the time homosexual. And then he could reverse the homosexuality and then he could reverse it the other way all dependent on what they were exposed to. So this got me thinking that intimacy and love is under attack that from millennials to multi-orgasmatrons because nature wants you to have orgasms to keep your brain healthier, your relationships health healthier, and your family healthier, I needed to put all this together in a very cogent, respectfully written book that a parent could gift to their adult kids starting to have a serious relationship or getting engaged, or even those people out there because so many people feel guilty about sex, don't know about sex, and so I ended up without ever knowing I would write a book like this, putting all of that information to help you have pleasure because nature wants you to. But the environment today is robbing you of it. And then I call that environmental castration the problem and the solution. 
Wow. This is, uh, oof. Well. <laughs> it's real. It's a real issue. It's a real issue in our <laughs> juice. <laughs> I mean, I swear there's just no end to it. I know. It's like, so bisphenol A, which lines cans, even organic are buns of bean cans, and lines water pipes and water systems, and is the white filling that we use as an alternative instead of the amalgam mercury filling, which we knew wasn't good for us. Bisphenol A has been shown in um, Permanente Kaiser research in conjunction with um, Asian researchers to make men have loss of desire in sex, erectile dysfunction, and they're exposed to higher levels in um, on the job. But the hormone system, we're talking about chemicals that disrupt your hormones. And our bodies are set up to take hormone signals with little proteins in the shape of receptor dishes, like satellite dishes, in parts per million and trillion. So per trillion is like a drop of water in 600 railroad car trains. and Per billion is like a dash of salt and 10 tons of potato chips. You can't even wrap your brain about how small that is. So your hormone system is set up to respond by nature to your own hormones in infinitesimally small amounts. So when we're talking about exposure in your everyday life, in things that come out of the water in the shower or your personal care products or your outgassing carpets or sitting in the car in an urban area with a lot of particulate matter in the air. It's very real. It's very real. And it's happening to make your internet, um, your hormones or your physiologic internet system, which send messages not just for sexy things, not just for reproductive things, but to keep all of you well. And I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, everybody thinks about sex. You don't want to think that a nun and a monk in a monastery have fleeting moments of thoughts about sex, but they do. You don't want to think that that doctor in the white jacket, so professional, the expert in the Mayo Clinic sitting opposite you could never have a thought about sex, but he does. Because the pull, the biological pull of the power of hormones is huge because nature intended that because Pleasure and connection are part of health, and we minimize it as frivolous, or we don't even know, we don't experience the orgasmic Richter scale that we used to, but it's right up there with running that track, going to the gym, and eating good food, and you can do it even without intercourse. It could be bonding and hugging and eye contact. Nature set it up that connection, which I call the true vitamin C, so you could be solo or you could say, forget the bedroom, I want to know how to connect without the bedroom stuff, I'm done with that. Connection it has a huge payoff, but we're becoming less and less connected as urban contemporary human beings. And thus I wrote this book because I felt there was a need, and I'm hoping that this book will help many, many people get pleasure back into their lives. Okay, now this your book, Sexy Brain. This is like hormone deception, healthy digestion, the natural way, and safe hormones now converge in the American bedroom. You know, let's let's go to this gut thing first. You know, I've okay. heard it said over and over again, really, and it, most recently and, and most often over the last two or three years, that everything is in the gut. And I'm like, uh, okay, yeah, I, I get that, you know, but only on the surface. So, I, I mean, I understand that uh, nutrient processing and, and all this, to, you know, toxin elimination and everything else is in the gut. So when we talk about the gut, are we just talking about the internal organs or are we talking about the the just one specific group of organs like intestines or liver or kidneys, or are we talking about all of the guts? Is it everything is in the gut or everything is in the guts, plural? <laughs> in my book, I say it's the shocking awareness that sex starts in the gut. And the gut is the mothership. And the gut has a lot of different parts. And I'm talking about the gut, the gut wall, which is supposed to protect you from things that shouldn't cross. The, the gut is your outside of the world in the middle of you. Right. And some things should get into your bloodstream and some things shouldn't. But Harvard in 2013, these really cool researchers at Harvard were able to show 
that the microbiome that lives inside the gut, which is a teeming, kind of like another organ that lives in us and then is supposed to take care of us for the right to live in us. And it's made of microbial teeming life of bacteria, fungus, and, and, um, and viruses. And it is a grouping of huge material that has broad influence on our health. They have receptors, little satellite dishes in the shape of, um, little proteins in the shape of satellite dishes that take hormone signals and there is a lifelong from puberty crosstalk between your gut flora and your gut wall and hormones in your bloodstream that go back and forth and back and forth to keep your hormones working healthfully. So you could go to your doctor and get your hormones tested and they say they're fine and you say I don't feel that well and they say your hormones are fine you say I don't feel that well. It could be that there's all these under subterranean levels of, of issues that affect your hormone health. One of them is your gut health. So if you've been on a lot of antibiotics, you eat a lot of sugar, you eat a lot of junk food, you drink excess alcohol, you make life choices that make you have an unhealthier microbiome. The crosstalk with your hormones, especially testosterone, can be really poor. So now you've got one-way dominant conversations or silent, dead conversations, and your hormones, which look normal in any assessment, blood, saliva, urine, urine spot, they look fine on the test, but they're not really able functionally to crosstalk with your gut, and that could be one of the contributing factors. In fact, unwell gut health is now a major, but only in docs and people that understand this, it's a major contributor to poor hormone health. And part of getting your hormones working better, so part of getting a young person's libido improved, is assessing their digestive function, their gut function, and working along with that. Um, there's receptors along from your mouth all the way to your south for all your hormones, estrogen, testosterone, oxytocin, adrenaline, cortisol, insulin, and all of those hormones affect the gut, but we don't think of them in terms of gut health. And in the last 15 years, I've been using strategic use of hormone replacement to treat inflammatory bowel disease and even low libido. So the gut and your hormone health are intimately mingled, but that awareness in the clinical trenches has not made it. Uh, it's not there yet. Thus, I'm writing books like this to inform the public so that they can demand more awareness from their health care providers. Well, it does seem obvious that if you're not healthy and you're not, you're not feeling healthy, uh, it's going to affect every aspect of your life, including your interpersonal relationships. I mean, that just kind of stands to reason. But for it to become so widespread and people to be so unaware that this is what's happening to them, I guess if you turn your back on the, on the, uh, the, the physical aspect of, of things, as far as the possibilities that your physical condition, whether you know it or not, is affecting your love life, they immediately turn to, well, there must be, then, then what's wrong? I guess they, they immediately start looking for mental slash emotional problems when it's really not a mental or an emotional problem. Uh, it, it could become that, but it starts somewhere else. Right, and often when you fix that, you really, we, I have patients in their 80s and 90s. I had this one patient in mind right now. She was on 15 or 16 meds. She gained a lot of weight. No one will listen to her. She's an older, overweight woman. Not a lot of doctors take someone like that really seriously. You'd like them to think that they do, but they don't necessarily do. She was isolating herself. She wasn't really there for her family. And we worked on her gut. We found that there was one um, pharmaceutical that she was on, that the side effect was inappropriate weight gain. We got her off of that and gave her some natural answers instead of that one. And within about five, six months, she was down to just two or three meds that were right for her. She was back on hormones. Her bone density normalized. She became this outgoing, gregarious person. And you get cards from the kids saying, thank you for giving me my mom back. And she comes into the office and says, you know, I'm going on a date with the guy that cleans my pool. <laughs> and wow. her, she's a totally different person. She's got herself back. And most people think, well, you're 70, you're 80, you're 90. But it doesn't, you know, we centenarians are the fastest growing demographic now that we have. And you can be, you can turn poor health around even then and give you vitality 
and the gut and the intimacy part of it are very powerful. I'm looking at your website. It uh, I, I put in um, I put in body mind hormones. It took me immediately to Burks and Health. Do they all kind of lead to Burks and Health, or are some of these websites stand alone? Uh, Doctor Lindsay Burkson stands alone. Okay. Um, all right then. What seems to be the biggest and most widespread problem among just the populace in, in general? It's I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of taking from from what you're saying that, you know, there is no shutoff age for. It's like this this old man was asked. He was in his 80s, you know. Uh, some young man asked him, "Well, you know, he was he'd been married for a couple of years and things were going okay, and he just was having a conversation with this old man, and he said, uh, he said, well, at w- at what point does uh, does you know the physical aspects, your your love life, when does when does that kind of go to the wayside?" <laughs> And the old man said, well, son, you'd have to ask somebody a lot older than me. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Well, you know, there are a few things that do keep us going. But, and I can name them, but hormone, measuring your hormones to make sure that you have healthy hormone health and all of the aspects that play a role, the nutrients that feed your hormones, the gut microbial life that feeds your hormones, that's all part of that. In fact, so Dr. Richard Wiseman opened the Wiseman practice. He just retired last year. In fact, he's building a home in Costa Rica and opening up a little medical center there. He said he just he's doing Ironman races in his late 70s. And he's been on hormones for years. And he would say at the water fountain with me, we'd have these great conversations. I love conversations in the clinic at the water fountain. You learn a lot. And he would say, if you took 100 people, that all got the memo for exercise and veggies. They were all doing it. But 50% of them had their hormones balanced. And each person has an individual hormonal footprint. One person, their gut is healthy. Another person, it isn't. Some person needs testosterone. Another person has too much testosterone. It's individual. You could cherry pick out out of the 100 people, the half of them that had healthier hormone health. They have better skin. You asked about my skin. They have better posture. They ha- their voice sounds more like a younger person than an older person's voice because hormones run all of these things, especially your brain. And the most important thing that your hormones run, <clears throat> and I love to speak of this, it's one of my favorite anatomical parts besides the other. Right. The other is in your brain there is this magical little tiny area called the hippocampus and it's really your physical analogy of your soul and it's where you have your memories you make new memories and remember your old and your motivation and your sense of who you really are and it's so important to nature that it's got the highest blood supply of any tissue in your whole body and it's got the highest organelles for energy mitochondria of any tissue in your body so nature said Tissue-wise, this is the top of the heap. And it's completely lined with proteins in the shape of receptors that take messages from estrogen, testosterone, oxytocin. When you're younger, you even make testosterone right there in your hippocampus. You have many, as many receptors for testosterone as the male prostate has. And when you get cognitive diseases like Alzheimer's, Lewy body dementia, just call it cognitive decline, it's now known as hippocampal shrinkage because that's where you are you. And those cells shrink and your life expression of that is frailty, you think of things, you can't do it, you feel more insecure of yourself, you can't remember stuff, you're overwhelmed. This is how people get when they're older because their hippocampus is shrinking. And at McGill University in 2008, I love this literature, they now can take functional MRIs of the volume of the hippocampus and they would see in older people it shrunk. Aging is shrinking and they would give women injections of estrogen and men injections of testosterone and they would revolumize it like that scene of Goldie Hawn and First Wife's Clubs where she's sitting in front of Carol Reiner with her lips and she wants a filler of her lips and she goes fill them up and hormones fill up the hippocampus and you could reverse that shrinkage and you can make somebody younger and these people who had frailty then became stronger and making love releases hormones 
nature intended for, or even hugging, hugging, bonding, kissing, even your kids, doesn't have to be with the mate, connection releases hormones that feed your hippocampus. The more connection you have, the more you stay you. Some people need hormone replacement. I had all those organs removed, so I don't have any organs left that make hormones. So I'm on lots of hormone replacement that allow me to be who I am. But I didn't know that making love was like a low-carb, paleo-friendly, multivitamin, mineral, uh, bioidentical hormone mixture. And all levels, all, all swaths of connection from just hanging out with your best friend to hugging with your friend or your lover to the bedroom, all of those have different levels of releasing hormones that feed the hippocampus. So I was like, oh my God, this is like really amazing information that people don't understand about. And we become less connected. Our kids are more connected to the IT phone in front of them. They don't even look at you in the eye when you're talking to them. They're not learning connection. They're learning connection with technology trumping connection with each other and their hippocampus, hippocampi tissue aren't being fed. Wow. Yeah, I, do, I don't think the staring at the screen syndrome is, uh, is, is helping anybody. It's uh, actually, I mean, just to use this uh, now time-worn expression, it really is turning people into zombies of sorts. It, it's really just sucking the humanity right out of them. It really is. And combined with, um, with these uh, errant electromagnetic frequencies of varying uh, strength, I mean, I just don't see this ending well. Let me ask you this. How can, is there any way to get in front of this? It, it seems like, and for some reason, THX 1138 flashed into my head where you got the underground civilization. You know, Lucas's first movie, right, and Robert Duvall was in it. It's like you got the you got the spooky ones that live up there on the surface. They're just wild people, and uh, like like homeless people who are all doing methamphetamine continuously. And then you've got this highly advanced civilization underground. And I'm going wait 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 wait. This is an interesting presentation, but it, does it really have to be one or the other? It uh, doesn't. But because our receptors are clogged with pollutants that are twenty four seven, you know there was that public forum by Harvard School of Public Health, January 31st, uh, Lancet came out with an article at the end of de December 2016 that $340 mil um, billion dollars of our health care are due to toxic pollutants. You can clean out your receptors. You can do science-based re sex receptor detox. You can make sure that you have within your day, just like you have exercise and you have veggies and you have things that are healthy, that you have connection and you can have connection, even if you're single, you can seek about having connection in whichever way works for you. So once you're aware, awareness is the first step. If you're aware that you might be polluted, if you're aware that you might be disconnected, you can start taking steps. And in my book, I give one of the very first ever 10-day sex receptor detox that people can do to really help clear out pesticides, phthalates, bisphenol A, etc. And you, you, you can't shop yourself smarter. You can't live in Seinfeld's bubble boy universe, you know, that would be ideal to do this. You have to, you can minimize your exposure and reduce it, but you also have to house clean. And it's interesting that making love helps house clean. There's replicated literature that shows that men that make love more regularly, three to five times a week over a lifetime, have less prostate cancer because making love rinses the prostate of these pollutants that we can be exposed to. And it's similar in women in breast tissue. So you can love the one you're with and be solo, or you could be on match.com and love the one you find, but you can really just add this bigger piece of awareness that you need some house cleaning on somewhat of a regular basis. You want to try and minimize exposure to a certain degree, but you can't do it 100%. <clears throat> but you have tremendous control over your home and your bathroom where most of the exposure comes from. We think of super fun sites and urban areas, but the EPA did a 10-year team study where they put exposure badges on a representative sample of about 3,500 Americans to see where the heck do Americans get this bad stuff in them. And the bad news is it was mostly in your home, and the good news is it was mostly in your home, because in your home you can do a lot about it. So in Hormone Deception, I gave a room-by-room -room tour to decrease 
pollution in your office and in your home and your supermarket cart. But now in se Sexy Brain, I take it further by giving you detox protocols that I've been using in my own patients for the last 15 years that have helped them reboot their intimacy, reboot their connection, reboot the benefits from these magical connections that nature's template intended for us. And um, nature does want you to connect, whichever which way it feels comfy for you to do that. And you don't have to live underground to pull that off. You just have to figure out how to get that into your life in a healthy way that you enjoy. Not that, not another should upon. Oh, I should connect. I should exercise. I should eat well. But something that speaks to your soul that makes you really feel good about doing it. I'm all for people trying to have discipline of things they enjoy. You know, I hear these couples. I've heard all sorts of things over the years, you know, that um, um, men and women, you know, they've been together for a long time, and, and they've, they, uh, on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at exactly 10 a.m., they have sex. I'm thinking to myself, now that sounds like a recipe for some serious boredom, but that's just me, you know. So let me ask you this. I, I, a lot of people think they know I think the answer. I can do things by the calendar myself. But more sponta I'm a more spontaneous diva. <laughs> say, say that again. I, I missed a little bit. I'm more of a spontaneous diva. Well, yeah, you know. Let me ask you something. I think I know the answer to this question. I mean, I've got my own answer to it, but it, I could be wrong. Um, according to Dr. Lindsay Berkson, what's the difference between sex and making love? Making love, I call it awakened sex. So, See, now we have functional MRIs, and we can go inside the brain of men and women while they're making sex, if they're heterosexual, homosexual, solo, this and that. We can take a look around. And based on that, they have found that when you make love with somebody that you respect, feel safe with, you have a regular interaction with, more areas of your brain light up so that making love becomes a cranial gymnasium. Really? Not ad nauseum, but gymnasium. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the, so I t most people think if they meet the right person, everything will fall in place perfectly because they met the right person. But you couldn't sit down in front of a piano and just wish yourself into being a virtuoso pianist. You couldn't do it. You'd have to get educated in practice. And what we learned from Sweden, and we're learning from a lot of other science-based literature, is that no, very few people are born with knowing how to be really great lovers, even with the right person. So in Sexy Brain, I take you, I give... Um, it's really exciting. I give some unpublished data from Dr. Michael E. Ba uh, uh, what's it? Baker from San University of California in San Diego, and he's been studying how estrogen and testosterone have been signaling with each other for hundreds of thousands of years. Really? And when I looked at the science of that and went from there to how hormones signal and receptors, and I moved it up and up and up the chemistry chain into your bedroom, I saw how men and women, based in science, are hardwired, and I came up with the theory of the hormone language of love to make it less frustrating and more successful, and to translate that into awakened love. How do you really please a woman based on the way she's been signaling for hundreds of thousands of years? And, and no one's ever done this before. I put this together. It was something that spoke to me when I was writing this book. I had no idea when I started writing this book it would come out, but it's very, very fascinating how men and women need each other, or the masculine and the feminine element, so it doesn't have to be a man and a woman, but it can be same-sex people, but with that, that polarized energetic. But it's very real, and so I give the exact steps to be a really, really great lover, not a wham-bam and you don't get the same brain and health global benefits from wham bam. You don't. What do you, make, what do you make of all this gay stuff? This this pro proliferation of the um, the um, the gay lifestyle. I mean, I, I understand that bisphenol uh, has a gender bending component in it. I'm not a scientist, but I've read a lot of reports that suggest that it's yeah, it definitely does. I've I've never seen so much gender confusion in in my life. I mean. 
generally, if you if you ran into somebody who was in those days, just called them queer. Now, I remember I was downtown uh, in downtown Dallas, and I don't know, long time ago in the '60s, walking down the street. Boy, this one guy was walk, walked past on the sidewalk, and when he saw me, he just lit up like a jack o' lantern, and it, I could tell it ticked my dad off. You know, we just kept going, and I said, "What was up with that?" He said, "He said he's queer. Don't worry about it." You know, and I went, "Okay." But, I mean, he was. He was like, he was ready to pounce like a chicken on a June bug. And <laughs> and I'm just, but, but you know, you see this all over the place, and people seem to be drifting. I mean, I, just, I got a note from uh, somebody who's been on the program who said uh, she was in Dallas uh, doing a conference and was just astounded how many um, transsexuals, how many gay people she saw. And I, and I just said, look, you know, Dallas has been a big-time gay town for a long time, long time. You know, everybody's gay is a Castro district of San Francisco in, in a couple areas of the city. But I digress. What is bringing all of this on? Is it just the sheer numbers, uh, increase in numbers in the population? So percentage-wise, it becomes more visible? Or, or is there something pointing people this direction? Well, it's very interesting that the early literature in DES offspring, remember DES is the model compound. If we hear we have a drug that we know is the most gender-bending, estrogenic, endocrine disrupting drug ever created by uh, Sir Charles Dobbs, the same guy who created plastics. And in the early literature, there was a non-controlled study that suggested that DES offspring would have more lesbians in them and be more apt to not marry. And it was never replicated, but the buzz was started. And this was about in the 19, um, in, in probably around the 1960s, 50s that that article came out it was a long time ago maybe a little bit later than that fast forward the work of Tyrone Hayes at Berkeley where he could actually create due to pesticide exposure ho homosexual frogs and then he could uncreate them and in all the mole literature with oxytocin where one species of moles mate for life they're prairie dogs and another species are promiscuous and if they change their hormones around they can make the promiscuous ones monogamous and vice versa wow. and they even with more gender bending with hormone replacement fussing with oxytocin and prolactin they could they could choose a vole a female vole that they would want a male vole to mate with and they could make that guy want that woman and it's all done with hormones that is the power of hormones. And remember, nature set up your hormone signaling system to be responsive to parts per million and trillion. So you'd have to say that it's, no one knows exactly why we're seeing so much gender bending, but the original research when I came out with hormone deception, many of the articles were called gender bending compounds. That's what we see with them, and that's the power of hormones. And we know that if you spray oxytocin up a man's nose before he makes love with a woman, he'll want to talk more and be more empathetic after making love. And the hormones that we release during making love make our mates look better to us and it keeps us more mated and bonded with them the more we make love with them. Love making is a glue and it does make us see this one person as more desirable because hormones are that po powerful. They're the main signaling molecules are the emails the email system of your computer of your body and so you have to think that a polluted environment is gender bending so all this research started years ago with Lou Gillet at the University of uh, Florida and he saw these manly manly crocodiles have little teeny Mr. Willies and they were feminized and he'd have to go in the water and capture these huge alligators and measure their their he's famous for this and his wife Elizabeth Gillet did um, studies in in Mexico that were very similar the effects of pollutants on how human beings unfold especially sexually endocrine disruption was first noticed by gender bending in animals in wildlife feminine birds starting to have male genitalia male animals starting to act feminized and not being able to reproduce. Then we asked the question, could this be happening in humans? And while I was at the Center for Bioenvironmental Research, Gore, I believe in conjunction with the center, we tried to raise about five million bucks, which now doesn't sound like very much money, to test 
of all the 80,000 compounds released since World War II, only 2% 2 have ever been tested by the EPA if they're endocrine disrupting. We have no idea of the chemical soup we're in. So it's one of the issues, but it's not the only one, because again, the perfect storm, things that happen in the human race take multi-factors that play a role, but young girls are having met, going into menstruation earlier. In Puerto Rico, babies, female babies are having breast buds, breast development at six months. Women are going into menarche, or, uh, menopause earlier. These are human milestones of reproduction of our whole race. Now, intimacy is being affected and gender bending is being affected. These are huge. What does that mean for how, where the race will go? So I'm saying you better clean out your receptors so that you can be as optimal as you can no matter which gender you choose to identify with. But I bet you the state of the planet and all of the chemicals circulating and saturating it are part of the issue. This is just disgusting, you know. <laughs> I mean, doesn't it just make you just, uh, I mean, it's enough to make you mad. I mean, I don't mean crazy. I mean, like, angry. That, 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 that obviously, this is known. It's, it's obvious that, that, that these uh, chemical companies and so forth and they've their scientific departments, they know this is happening. What? They've been denying it for so long. They don't live in Ohio. They don't live in Michigan. They live in the state of denial. And they didn't own up to it. But now the consensus is so huge. And, if, you know, if you're giving birth to children, the answer is before you conceive, because the most of these chemicals, many of them store in fat, they're lipophilic, and the egg and the sperm are filled with fat. So before you get pregnant, this is going to take us back to nuclear bonding. You want to choose your mate, together you want to detox and live healthfully so you have less of those chemicals in you, so then when you the egg and the sperm meet, you have less of a chance of having any kind of adverse outcome but having a healthier kid, all the way from attention issues, you know, how they think, perhaps to, you know, when they, any hormonally driven uh, issues. And we know that we're having these issues. We now have an epidemic of polycystic ovarian syndrome in teenage girls. That's our, we have 500 girls with this at the Wiseman Clinic. 500. It's really like menopause in teenage girls. A lot of it because of what the mom was exposed to throughout her life that she then gave as a legacy to the baby. So the answer is partially detoxification. You can get this stuff out of you. You just got to work at it and you have to live smarter and because you can't depend on the chemical companies reducing it, especially with our present political environment and changes in the EPA. You know, I don't know, we're not going to see this, but in your own life you can because the majority of your pollution you can change. And so I want to give people more hope than doomsday. Yeah, well, I think a lot of these departments need to go away. It's uh, like I like to say, if things don't add up, try subtracting, you know? Oh, I love that. Just saying. <laughs> now, let me ask you. Admissions, they're not clinicians. They're dealing with the science of the situation, but not with patients sitting in front of them that are dealing with the end result of it. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. What is the difference between hormones and pheromones? And are pheromones being disrupted also? Yes, because pheromones work based with, on healthy hormones. And when your hormones become less healthy, pheromones are those magical subliminal scents that turn you on to someone else and have a lot to do with the spark of life and interaction between human beings together. Not always a man and a woman, but often between a man and a woman. Men give off lots of hormones and testosterone under their armpits when they start to hug, and a woman is very responsive to testosterone when she starts to hug and she makes more and more that makes her want to interact more and more. So it's a hormonal dance. But the more your hormones are disrupted, the less you make pheromones. And as you get older, when you don't make hormones, a menopausal woman makes, <clears throat> excuse me, less hormones, but you can take hormone replacement and then you can get your pheromones somewhat rebooted. So with new technology, you can use hormone replacement to get your yourself, if you combine hormone replacement with healthy lifestyle choices and detox, you can <clears throat> get yourself out of some of this toxic soup and be a healthier person and a better lover and better kids because this comes down to the kids in the next generation. You pass on these toxic chemicals to your grandkids. So detox has got to move mainstream. That's just plain weird. 
That 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 is just strange. You're passing them on to your grandkids. They're transgenerational. Uh, you've got but a really good. And you clean it out of yourself, and you live healthier than you don't. So you have a strong co-creative role in what you pass on besides your money. You know, I don't know. Um, you you seem to have such a good attitude, uh, despite the fact that you have this gigantic volume of knowledge as to what's really bothering the human race. I mean, I, well, uh, do we wonder? You you've said grandchildren. Is it possible it would go even beyond their generation to great grandchildren? I mean, how long does this stuff get passed down? Well, they've been trying to monitor it in DES offspring, which are the main, we call a group of people that we watch scientifically, a cohort. So we have these cohorts of DES exposed in the womb, like myself, a few, like 10 or 15,000 people that they've been following over time and trying to figure these answers out. We don't totally know, but one DES granddaughter got ovarian cancer at 9 or 11 years old. We don't know about the great grandkids. That's not been written up yet. But the reason I feel positive, you know, when I came out with hormone deception, <clears throat> even my best friend didn't want to read it. She thought it was doomsday. Right. It was too much to deal with. <clears throat> but now she goes to the environmental working group and she looks before she buys a lipstick or a hair product and so forth. Because we have more, once you can get used to this is the new isness. This is our world. It's the isness. You know that there's steps that you can take to protect yourself and nutrients and detox that can make you healthier. If I wasn't doing everything I was doing, I'd be probably a lot more ill, but I'm healthier than ever. So nature is very forgiving. And I see this in my patients. When you do the right things and you fix the right problems in a very short period of time, you start getting better and better answers. But at the last few EDOT hormone conferences, a lot of the heads of environmental sciences of many of the different very prestigious colleges would hang out for dinner and a bunch of them would get drunk because they felt like we were doomed. We were just totally doomed. But then we started to invite people who had remediation ideas. How do you clean up Lake Apopta in Florida? How do you clean up Lake Michigan and Chicago? And a lot of these waters in different areas of sub-ecosystems are being cleaned up Remediation can work fast when we figure out those ways. Health can turn around when you figure out the ways. So even though there's this doomsday, knowledge is power to be informed. But then if you take proactive steps, you can get positive response. I know this in my own life, and I see it in my patients. And I know this in remediation efforts that I've witnessed. You know, I was somewhat um, part of Katrina, you know, when I was part of the Tulane think tank and Katrina happened during that period. So there's a lot that can be done. And even though it's overwhelming, it doesn't have to be the end of the story. And I really believe that that's true. I don't feel like I'm just being um, super idealistic. I think that this is based, I see this every day in my patients who maybe have had diabetes for 47 years and have been on metformin, insulin, the sulfurea drugs, and now with doing the right steps within a month, they're off most of their meds and their blood sugars are normal. It's it's extraordinary if you do the best things for yourself. So, got a lousy love life? Chances are you've become a toxic waste dump walking around on your feet. <laughs> I mean, this is really strange, but I mean, it doesn't surprise me the least because, I mean, we... Gosh, I wonder how many other things. I mean, there's just not enough time in one lifetime if you're if you're into the volume of work that you are to to maybe maybe you can do it. But but I'm thinking, okay, yeah, people's sex lives there. It's like sex has been around for a long time. I used to tell uh, uh, even my kids, listen, it's not that big of a deal. Don't obsess. All right, you see all this traffic out here. You see this gigantic. Traffic jam, that's a result of sex, you see, because all those people were born and they became adults and they got cars and now they're driving. 
And I'll also tell you that that all of their parents didn't get pregnant with just one lovemaking session. So there's a lot of sex going on out there. Don't let it go to your head because it's been around for a long time, all right? But not only does there's and, – and look at the, uh, look at the increase in um, – let me ask you this. Do you, do you get into the psychological aspects of it as far as an increase in pornography? Viewing pornography seems to rob young men particularly of their of their libido once they get out among the society of women. You know, because it's, again, it's all in your mind. So if you've already done it in your mind with, you know, 50 women, why would you care about going on a date? I mean, that's a simplistic uh, analysis, but it seems to be true. I do bring this up. I talk about all the different reasons that people are getting anesthetized uh, about connection. And porn seems to anesthetize young men. And they also have this idealized vision of how perfect a female body and response should be so that when they meet face to face with reality, it's a letdown. And it's a turn, it's not a turn on, it's a letdown. And so, again, everything is multifactorial, but pornography is definitely a part of young people's lives. It doesn't have the stigma that it did for us. It's part of their life. But you have to bring the discussion on the table to let them know if you are having problems with connection and you don't have great connection and you wonder why you're isolating and you don't want to be in a relationship, you have to take it the, look at the way you're living because everything that you're doing got you somewhat here. So it's a way of having awareness about how the isness of your life is a compilation of your own choices and actions. And it's really great to speak with young people like this because they're very open once you let them know the benefits that nature intended by great connection and how it can be, they want to hear how to have better connection. And they become more respectful of doing porn in a different way that isn't so massive but reduces down to a smaller font size that's not so numbing. Talking things out is very, very helpful, and most people don't have awareness of many of these factors that play a role in their psyche and their physiology and their love life and brain health. You know, I think that we should, um, there, are, there are so many aspects to your, uh, your area of expertise and study that uh, th- this cannot be the only time that we talk. There, there's way too much to get into here, and I noticed that on your <laughs> with that wine otherwise you, you got to promise me that di- i'll make you dinner you bring that wine <laughs> okay you got yourself a deal let's do it okay. um and uh, folks i gotta tell you something these um these uh these, these are uh dr Lindsay. there's uh there these books are not cheap necessarily you, you know what i mean so if people were going to go well, say I don't have this kind of dough. I can't drop. A, I can't. I can't spring for the whole collection. What do you think are the most important ones for people to begin the journey because of, of restoring their health and their lives? Because uh, look, we've got one shot at this. We may have. We may there. There may be reincarnation. May be a real thing. Maybe we'll come back dozens of times. And it's fine. But I mean, we don't know that for sure. So I'm thinking we should maximize the life that we have going now and not count on coming back and everything's going to be great because the next one may suck even more, so to speak. So um, great if you could go to the florist shop and say, I want to order a dozen incarnations. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'm thinking. Um, okay. So sexy brain, it's hot off the press and it's got really valuable, usable material. Hormone Deception stands as good as it did when I wrote it. I did an edition that came out a few months ago, and it really takes you through a room-by-room tour of your life, of your office, your supermarket cart, your home, on how to reduce exposure, and it explains the, the situation. I think those two are the most important, and if you want to learn how to eat more consciously, I wrote Retraining Your Tongue. For most of my families, it's a colorful picture book. For you with young kids that you could just go through and teach your kids how to eat well with consciousness in a fun way. But the two most important books right off the top are um, Sexy Brain and Hormone Deception. If women are battling the discussion of whether they should be on hormone replacement or not, I address that in Safe Hormones Smart Women. But I think the two at the top are those two. Hot off the press, Sexy Brain how love is under assault, and what you can do about it, and then hormone deception, explaining this problem that everyone is saying is real. National Geographic had an entire magazine set on it. 
Countries all around the world are banning things that are not banned here in this country, but knowing what to do in your own home can make a huge difference, especially for your kids and your love life. But you just need to know some steps, and I give that in that book. You know, this is really, uh, and seriously, I'm, I'm not gushing here. This is an amazing body of work. It really is. But there are, uh, and which book would have the, uh, now in the hormone deception, does that give people an idea how they can, uh, how they can get this stuff that's bad for them out of their systems? Is it possible to chelate this stuff out? Um, no, chelation doesn't do that. It's with detox. And the detox that I recommend for that is in Sexy Brain. Okay. I do discuss detox in hormone deception, but I didn't have it as well honed as I do now in writing this book that's launching Valentine's Day the day that we're having the show. That's the day this book is the, the first day of the book being launched and set out from Amazon is Valentine's Day. And my Valentine's gift to everybody there is learning how to clean out their hormone systems so your immune system is better, your gut is better, your brain is better, and your intimacy is better. Doctor, you just called me on something, and I'm glad that you did. What's the difference between chelation and detox? So chelation is the Latin word for to claw. And it does it by attaching on to sulfur atoms, and it pulls out heavy metals. It's a heavy metal binder. So you use chelation if you've got excess. There's no amount of lead that's really good for you, but if you've got excess lead, excess cadmium, etc. And interestingly enough, all these heavy metals are also endocrine disruptors because most of them act as estrogen mimics. And it's in fact one of the reasons. One of the major contributors to our epidemic of diabetes is an increase in cadmium and arsenic, which all act as estrogen disruptors and contribute to futzing with the insulin receptor and making us have higher blood sugar levels and more fatty livers. So, um, But chelation basically clears out heavy metals. The detox that I present in Sexy Brain clears out endocrine disrupting compounds, a wide array, that's an umbrella term for things like pesticides, bisphenol A, um, or volatile organic pollutants, and things like that. It cleans out your receptors. And a hormone is a, a hormone delivers a signal to a receptor, but if this receptor is clogged, it can't get in. We think of insulin resistance, thyroid resistance, but you can have resistance to any hormone, and that's what we've been talking about, androgen resistance, antiprogestin, um, oxytocin resistance, cortisol resistance, or you can have excessive signaling. You can have anything that's too much, too little, and you could have a problem. So hormones love the Goldilocks middle, but to do that, they have to have healthy receptor, what I call physiology. And at the think tank where I worked in Tulane, the whole focus was how to have a healthier receptor. And this sex receptor detox makes your receptors healthier so they can clean out and get healthy signals from all of your hormones, which are a wide family of many players that work together to keep you healthy and often are making you ill because they're not working together. Yeah, we're going to have, we're definitely going to have to do a part two because there's, there's just too much to talk about. There really is. Now, we have grown up. You know, you think you know, but you don't. You think you know what you're talking about, but you don't. I've been guilty of this myself, and I guard against it continuously. And when I'm wrong, I want to immediately sing out and say, bad call, wrong, I was over. I identified Greg Abbott the other day, our governor here, is, as uh, the former lieutenant uh, governor, and that's not correct. He was the former attorney general. I had him mixed up with somebody else. Um, ju- I mean, even minor points like this. And what I'm getting at is a lot of people think that hormones have to do, we always hear about hormones uh, and and it's in connection with women. Men apparently are not aware that they have them also. That's such a great comment. And most people think hormones are only about sexy and reproductive things. Yeah. Hormones, these signal and receiver, are all throughout your body, your brain, your immune system, your vocal cords, your kidneys, your colon. These are what deliver messages to genes to have your own life unfold and keep you well and when they don't work right you're more vulnerable to disease and men and women have all the same hormones but just in different amounts viva la difference but men have estrogen men have um, oxytocin even though that's historically thought of as a pregnancy hormone men have oxytocin and um, 
hormone health in men is huge. Andropause is real in men. We are all living longer, but if your hormones age before you age, then what happens is you have a really um, bad time with aging. You are a much older person. Hormones, for example, we think, well, why should I take testosterone? If I'm 70 years old and nature had me have low testosterone, so what? I'm a 70-year-old person. I should have low testosterone. But testosterone helps keep your mitochondria, which are your energy organelles, jamming, especially in the hippocampus that we spoke about before. The healthier your mitochondria, the less brain fog, the more motivation and you can carry it out, the more you want to keep working at whatever you love to do, the more you have energy to get out of bed and face the day. The mitochondria is your true money in the bank because it's your energy. Testosterone boosts mitochondrial health. It's just, that's one of the reasons it's produced when we're younger, right in the hippocampus, to, care, to caretake the hippocampus, which are higher in cell volume in the hippocampus, your mitochondria, than any other cell in your body. So our hormones protect our heart. Keeping your testosterone at a healthier level reduces the risk of premature death of your heart cell, your cardiomyocyte. So men have andropause and sometimes replacement for men really changes, especially people don't realize this. A lot of aches and pain of older age used to be called rheumatism. Right. Now it's called arthritis, generalized right. OA, you know, osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that, if you get hormone replacement, I, I had one man that had shoulder problems. He was about 51, not that old, really young but he was flatlined on his testosterone and he had very severe shoulder problems so he was set up to have shoulder surgery which is a major surgery. The recovery from that is very bad. So he was given one shot of testosterone his shoulder pain left in an hour or two he never had it back again. Hormones lubricate your joints and waning hormones are the number one cause of aches and pains of old age and when you get hormones back on track and a few other things that you can do with it most people get rid of all those aches and pains. You don't have to have those aches and pains because you're older. Unless you identify with them, identify with being older and feel like I'm old, I have sitting syndrome, I'm going to watch the world go by. But if you do other right steps, you have another few decades where you don't have to be that person. You can be another person. And I see this all the time, but people have to make dietary changes, they have to make exercise changes, and often hormone changes and intimacy connecting changes and then you have this life that you really didn't know was possible at an age where you thought you'd be really having the sitting syndrome so it's amazing how often we I can get someone that's 79 that was just sitting tired aching and now they're back golfing off of that chair feeling phenomenal and off many of their medications and their relationship is turned on like it was when they first met. That's huge. Then old age doesn't look as bad because you're having younger age in your older age. But you have to tend to all of these different pillars of it to see if you can pull that off. Okay. Remember they told me 20 years ago I'd never be a dynamic. I go on dance marathon weekends. I go on canoeing trips for a week. I love to canoe. I go to the gym every day. And they told me I would never do those things, ever. Never take ever and never for an answer. I just I go to this gym in Austin. It's on a beautiful quarry lake. And right above the door when you walk in, it says never, never, never give up. And every day when I walk through that door, I read that to myself and I inform all my molecules Never, ever, ever give up. We're in this together. Into the gym. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. I got to, I got to tell you, Lindsay. You, I, th I think you're an amazing individual. I really do. Um, now, do you have your own clinic? Well, I'm semi-retired, so I have a a home office that I see people at and part time. Yeah. And I see people part time at a number of other clinics around town, and I consult with people all over the world. I do educational consults with people in Barbados and Israel and Spain, and I do that over Skype like you're doing here with me or over the phone. And I'm doing a lot of writing and teaching. I've got that other book, Nutritional Gastroenterology, coming out, which is a 650-page kind of textbook coming oh. down the pike next. Oh, is that all? 
huge. Yes, it's huge. It's really for doctors. It's really for doctors. <laughs> wow. Hey, you know, before this get, this thought gets away, I want to ask you about something. What about okay. uh, HGH? What about human growth hormone? I understand that does wonders for people's testosterone and other things, too. I've also heard that in some cases it will cause the organs to grow, which is not cool. Do you, do you know much about it? Does it factor? Does it feature in your research at all? I do not write about it in Sexy Brain. When I was working in Tulsa, I was working in Tulsa for six years with this amazing, brilliant internist. I would go there one week out of each month, but he died, sadly, at the end of last October. So now I'm back in Austin full time. And many people in that clinic were on human growth hormone. And many people with Dr. Wiseman, when he was running the clinic and he just retired to Costa Rica, were on human growth hormone. And you really can see a difference. People lose weight. They gain a lot of, they get very buffed, they get an intensity to them that you usually have when your your hormones are pulling on your biology strongly when you're younger. The problem is it's a growth trophic substance, and so it gives you growth signals. And there are a few isolated cases in the literature of it causing cancer in people who had a history of cancer. Since I've had cancers, I don't want to be on a growth signal promoter. In fact, I don't even eat foods a lot of them that have growth signals in them because of my own personal history. And when I work with people nutritionally, I work with problems that they've been dealing with and try and set up a diet that honors them to have less recurrence of whatever that bad problem they had. So human growth hormone in some cases is a little tweaky. I have had a few patients that were on it. I didn't put them on it, but they were on it for their own choice. They wrote a disclaimer knowing they might have issues that did go on to get cancer and some other health problems. But it is one of the, you see these men that are just totally buffed and they're on testosterone and often they're on that in combination with human growth hormone. And it does give a big bang for your results, but it does have this potential shadow side. So you have to work with a practitioner that can inform you of your pluses and minuses like anything you do in medicine, anything, risk versus benefit, and decide if something is right for you. For me, it was a little too scary to go on it, though I I eye it like, oh, God, I'd love to be on that to be even more buffed, even more, you know, all that I could be, but it's not worth the risk for me, so I'm choosing not to do that. And that's how you have to approach everything. What is the plus and what is the minus of this? What have been my weakest points in my life? What have been my best points? Can I possibly live with the worst case scenario if I get that with this thing? And if I can't, then we jointly make a decision I won't do that. So that all has to be a discussion to find the thing that's best for you with as best a decision as you can make. Yeah. Well, there's no point in building more horsepower than the engine can withstand. <laughs> yeah, that's not, that's not the way to hot rod fun. Okay, I get it. Well, would you mind awfully, in closing, if I just said that you, in the manner of the great, late Lord Patrick McGowan, have have eminently vindicated and illustrated the right of the individual to be individual, and it is my pleasure to induct you into our Order of the Ark Knights. And this assembly rises to you, Dame Lindsay, Dame Dr. Lindsay. What a blast it was talking to you today. It really was. That is so funny that you said that because one of my joys in my life is I belong to a comedy Toastmaster club. We meet every Thursday night at Big Burger Daddy's and <laughs> I love humor and they, I go by my first name there because it's perfect. It's like Cher. It's like David Key and they call me Dame David Key. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're double Dame now. Love it. Thank you. This has been so much fun, and it's been such an honor. I've been a fan of yours ever since one of my dear friends in Santa Fe told me about you 20-some years ago because your voice and, and how you go into a topic so artfully and beautifully. I'm so excited to be on this show. Really, it's, it's a highlight for me, and I've been loving being on it with you and talking with you. Oh, you're so kind. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I used to do a couple of TV stations out there. I did... Uh, KOAT, Channel 7, and out of Albuquerque, and then another one. I can't remember the call letters now, but anyway. Yeah. Oh, well. I've, I've put myself in a position now where I can run, but I can't hide. So why bother, <laughs> right? <laughs> Just go out on the clothesline and have a good time. A real pleasure, Doctor. I'm serious. And uh, we will meet again on this program, and I look forward to uh, meeting you in person down there in Austin. I'll bring the boogie. 
Oh, you bring the boogie and I'll bring the, uh, I'll, I'll make an incredible meal for you because I love to cook and it's all five star organic, but it tastes like, I love to cook food that tastes like you're sinning, but you're not. <laughs> well, that sounds absolutely perfect. It really does. I'm sure the divine Miss B will appreciate that as well. So uh, I look forward to seeing you. That'll be great. Thank you so much. Blessings. Thank, Bye-bye. thank you. Blessings to you too. Wow. Now, that's one of the coolest doctors ever. Usually, they're rather square, but not always. And um, and what an array of books here. So, yeah, go to uh, DrLindsayBerkson.com. And you'll see the whole layout here. And um, I think that was just great. All right, well, I think our musical selections today were appropriate. And um, when you think about it, Love is more powerful than absolutely anything else. It has healed like no drug can. Ultimately, it has enabled salvation from our fallen state into which we were born. If you want to get a little theological, then we will. But it's true. Love can conquer hate. Love is very powerful. Very powerful. So... It doesn't matter if they've made St. Valentine's Day into some commercial thing. It it doesn't matter. You know what's in your heart. And you've got a pretty good idea what's in the heart of the one you love. So, why not accentuate the, uh, the positive, the positive aspects of that? Just because somebody decides to make a buck off of something doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's not worth participating in. So have a happy Valentine's night, and may uh, the spirit of Valentine's Day carry over for you into the rest of the year, and then just uh, plan on recharging it uh, next Valentine's Day, all right? (laughs) It's just a year off. What's the big deal? Nobody ever said a year was very long. In fact, all the old people say, no, it's rather short. So enjoy. Live your life to the fullest. And above all, do everything that you do. Do you know the grandfather, Bruce Barton? the grandfather, the godfather of advertising. I'm serious about this. He said, do everything that you do for your clients with love. Everything. If you are not doing your work in love, I'm paraphrasing him, but you're screwing up. So now that you know, don't do that. Be seeing you. Much love, by the way.